thanks. I'm excited to to be here as well. And and Hugh, thank you uh, for the invitation to show uh, some of our work, which is uh, kind of related to the first two speakers, but kind of in a in a little bit different setting. So I want to uh, start by uh, telling you probably one of the most uh, in-depth uh, CH activation projects we've worked on uh, so far. And this is focusing on the family of these Elysium sesquiterpenes. And these are really some of the most highly oxidized uh, terpenes known. Some of them have actually even higher oxidation uh, given their carbon count than taxol. Um, some are oxidized at essentially every carbon. And if you're a part of the synthetic community, you've probably seen some of these molecules. They came out in the late 1960s, uh, starting with this very toxic compound anisatin in the, in the lower right corner, which was found to be a GABA receptor antagonist and uh, a, a really good way of, of, of killing uh, poor mice. Now, what's happened uh, lately is some newer members have come out, which have uh, been shown to promote neurite outgrowth. And these are shown in the top right corner and also um, caught a lot of uh, synthetic attention. And then you can see here on the left kind of a, a mix match uh, of different structures which have different hydroxylation patterns which ultimately ties them up into different lactones. And there's about a hundred or so of these Elysium sesquiterpenes to, to our count currently. And as I've mentioned, they've seen a lot of synthetic attention. Uh, the syntheses, um, to date, uh, range from quite lengthy in the case of anisatin uh, to quite efficient in the case of g -dephenylide. In fact, Ryan Shenby's group has synthesized uh, this compound in only eight steps, which is, is quite remarkable and something I, I've, I've kind of finally realized will, will most likely never catch it. Um, I'll tell you, our, our shortest route to this molecule. Now, I want to just briefly uh, take you through the biosynthesis. This is not really the CH activation part of the talk, but really kind of how the project started out uh, with, with in terms of how we, we thought about uh, starting materials. So these go through a pretty classic sesquiterpene biosynthesis. You get an ionization uh, to this allylic cation, cyclization to the bisabolyl system, and then at some point there's a hydride shift, another cyclization, and finally, you get to this uh, tricyclic sedrane cation. And I should mention all of these boxed intermediates basically lead to, to different natural product families. Now, in the case of the Elysiums, uh, what's thought to happen is there's an alkyl migration, uh, converting that 5-5 fused ring system into a 5-6. And then at some point, one of these CC bonds is cleaved, and that gives you uh, the seco prezizane skeleton which is believed to be the precursor to all of these compounds. So when we were starting out, we thought it would be interesting to look at some of these CH activations. Um, we thought a semi-synthesis approach might be nice. Uh, this has been used uh, quite extensively in steroid chemistry. Kind of a modern, uh, really nice example is Barron synthesis of Wabagenin uh, with Hans Renata. Now, the problem with that uh, idea was there are really no commercially available uh, building blocks that we can get our hands on that have this 5-6 fused ring system. And we didn't want to spend uh, a lot of uh, synthetic effort to, to synthesize this to just try these, these difficult reactions. Um, but when we were looking through this pathway, the sedrain cation really caught our attention in that we had in our lab uh, large bottles of some of these chemicals, which we had inherited um, from some of my senior colleagues. And these uh, basic hydrocarbon terpenes are some of the cheapest uh, building blocks you can imagine. So essentially about five cents uh, per gram for, for Cedrol. And we thought, you know, these are, this ring system is a, uh, kind of an intermediate on this pathway. Uh, would it be possible to use one of these and get to that sedrain cation or some, some sort of sedrain skeleton uh, and then do those final two steps and ideally pick up all these oxy oxygens along the way. So this is really uh, the crux of our problem. Could we convert a sedrain or sedrol ideally into all, all known Elysium sesquiterpenes? And we're not quite there yet, but I'll, I'll show you some, uh, some of our, our studies towards this. This was work uh, spearheaded by 
uh, Kevin Hung in my group, who was joined uh, later on by Matt Gendakis and a very talented uh, visiting student from Japan, Takahiro Morikawa. So we started out with Cedrol, and I don't think uh, you need any introduction to this reaction. Uh, Dave showed uh, some kind of 2018 upgrades to this type of process. This works quite nicely for us. Obviously, uh, functional group compatibility, compatibility with iodine, Dave mentioned, is a problem. We have no functional groups. Uh, this works very nicely in our hands. We can do this uh, really on, on 25 gram scale to give this kind of strain THF ring, which opens very nicely with mirwine salt. So this alkylates the oxygen and uh, undergoes elimination. So we've basically uh, done a methyl CH activation and put in uh, a double bond. And then we started to get a little aggressive, okay? So in situ generated ruthenium tetroxide uh, essentially cuts that bond uh, directly open. And at this point, we needed to do another CH activation. And what we came across uh, was an old paper uh, in Russian that had used copper bromide uh, to functionalize a CH bond. And, and this turned out to work quite nicely for us. So we heated this up with copper to bromide. This is not a catalytic reaction. We saw basically direct uh, CO bond formation at that alpha position. And this was really a, a saving grace to us because we were never able to oxidize this position uh, kind of with more canonical strategies like uh, enolate oxidation. We think we had trouble generating that enolate. But this intramolecular reaction worked very nicely. Now recall in the biosynthesis, I mentioned that you need to migrate one of the bonds to convert um, the sedrain ring system into the Prosico presizanes. So we decided to do this uh, not via carbocation rearrangement, uh, but by the alpha ketol rearrangement. So what we found is that if you hydrolyze open this lactone, uh, presumably making this bis potassium salt, this will actually uh, lie on the side of the ring shifted product. Okay, so we get uh, a pretty clean expansion to this product and nicely uh, a four to one DR at that new center. And presumably this is a, a thermodynamic product. We can take the, the minor isomer, resubject it to the reaction conditions and, and reestablish this, this uh, mixture. Okay, so with that, we protected that hydroxyl group. And we had essentially grams of this stuff to start trying some of these oxidative processes. Now, I think in, in all of the, the viewers are pretty familiar uh, with a, a carboxylic acid next to a, a CH bond. Of course, uh, you're thinking as we were, uh, iron-directed CH activation. Uh, Christina White has popularized a lot of this in, in recent times. And this turned out uh, to work to functionalize the CH uh, bond we could get about 30% yield of usable material. I, I consider those top two that, that could be used. We also would start to see um, degradation of the, the ether ring. Oops. Um, to start to make compounds that would ultimately break down further. One of the big challenges we had in this reaction was actually this uh, OTBS group. Uh, this is cleaved very quickly uh, by the reactive iron species. And we think it probably makes some sort of oxygen-centered radical, which starts to cleave adjacent CC bonds. And I'll show you some other examples where that happened. Uh, this ether was also deactivating towards that, that axial CH bond. So kind of in our early days, we were working on this model system, uh, which had instead just two methyl groups shown down here at the bottom. Uh, this actually worked quite nicely. We could get uh, a gram, gram quantities in about 52% combined yield of CH uh, hydroxylation. And we didn't have to use any of the, the heavy hitter iron complexes. So just a simple iron map ligand. This was uh, originally developed by uh, White and Jacobson for epoxidation. Uh, this worked quite nicely uh, in our case. Now, what we couldn't do, though, is oxidize that methyl group. Uh, later on in the synthesis. So this had to be strategically kind of choreographed to get uh, these different reactions in the correct order. 
Now, a lot of people have looked at other metals um, to do these type of processes. Uh, if you're familiar with some of Kevin Brown's really nice uh, work, he also had some challenges with iron and had looked to copper acetate to hydroxylate uh, some of these CH bonds. What we found is in, uh, in this system with copper, ruthenium, we would get exclusively, and these were these yields are not optimized, they're kind of just initial screens, um, CH activation next to the ketone. So this is, of course, uh, deactivated um, in the literature. We're not sure if this might go through an enol being epoxidized, right? This, could, this might not be a direct CH activation. And then here's a, a kind of neat reaction, uh, not a, not one we wanted, but uh, for you are dust and to dust you shall return, direct loss of CO2, right? So this is a common theme I think we've seen in a number of uh, synthetic projects. These molecules will start to just unravel, right? You'll start to cleave CC bonds and kind of just open up a lot of the rings. So here you can see this ruthenium complex essentially excises uh, by CO2 loss, the central uh, carbonyl of this ring system, uh, basically just opening up this ring. And I should mention there are some elysiums that look like they've undergone this type of process. So this might also be uh, utilized in nature. So we're working towards some related natural products that have this kind of uh, cleave skeleton. Now returning to the synthesis, um, we had that uh, position oxidized and what we decided to do next is to open it via an alkylation. So this gave us an, essentially a net desaturation of that double bond. And then we could um, use in situ generated TMS iodide to cleave that uh, methyl group, which closed down to the lactone ring, and TBAF took off that silicon protecting group. So at this stage, we thought we were really home free. All we needed to do was uh, dihydroxylate that alkene. And some work by Andy G Kendi's group had shown that it should come from the correct face, which would be the bottom face. Uh, unfortunately, in our hands, um, uh, osmium tetroxide gave us completely the wrong diastereomer. So you can see here that this has been dihydroxylated from the top. The lactone reforms, which we had just worked so hard to destroy, and this was obviously not uh, good news for us. Now, Matt had, uh, in my group, had found some reports by Donahoe uh, that showed that these TMEDA complexes could be used uh, for directed dihydroxylation. And remarkably, although this is a, a quite hindered alcohol, we can get essentially complete uh, switch and selectivity to what faces these come on just by, by changing the ligands on osmium. So that gives us the two alcohols down. Uh, what we did next was to mesylate this. Presumably we formed this mesylate uh, at that most accessible alcohol, although we didn't isolate this substance. We just threw it into some aqueous sodium hydroxide. And what we think happens is that the lactone is, is hydrolyzed open. You generate the sodium carboxylate, uh, which displaces the mesolate, uh, giving you now this lactone ring system. And this just funnels to the more stable uh, pseudoanisen isomer. So this was kind of our first foray into these natural products. Uh, we can make them in 12 steps from Cedrol. I should point out another kind of diverging pathway we've, we've noticed here. So this is the, that piece we can make in five steps. An undergraduate in my lab, uh, Stephen Harwood, uh, who's now in Phil Barron's lab, discovered this kind of interesting reactions. So when he stirred this with acid, uh, essentially the oxidized uh, position swapped to the other side, right? So this is not an oxidation, it, it's redox neutral. And what we think happens is you might make an oxalyl type cation and you get essentially a closer of the carboxylate uh, on the left side, which formally reduces the right side. And this was kind of interesting because then we can uh, treat this with a strong reducing agent and kind of do a net uh, deoxygenation. And again, without that extra oxygen there, we see that CH activation works quite nicely. 60% uh, yield, this is essentially with, with zero optimization, right, with right off the shelf iron map. Um, again, showing that, that oxygens uh, several atoms down really have a deleterious uh, 
effect on this transformation. And this serves as a, a really a formal synthesis of, of tasheronin or OD benzoyl tasheronin, uh, which Shenby has recently synthesized as well as uh, Sam Dana Shevsky's group. Now, what we really wanted to do, though, is get our hands on some of those more bioactive ones uh, of the medusin type. And if you kind of look at what we've done and where we need to go, you can see one of the challenges here is that that methyl group in pseudoanisatin is now a carboxylic acid in all of these compounds. So at some point, we're going to have to deal with oxidizing one of the methyl groups um, in Cedrol. So that was something uh, we knew was not going to be so easy. Now, this was uh, essentially the same team along with Steven. And what we did is, again, start with Cedrol uh, and the initial functionalization of that methyl position. And we kind of decided that we wanted to develop a different route which would avoid uh, one of those iron steps, which was really material limiting. And what we decided to do was instead of oxidatively cleaving open that olefin, we hydroborated it. And then when we work this up with chromium trioxide, you can get out directly the ketone and you can re-reduce that from the outer face to give you this uh, secondary alcohol. Now that is set up right over top of that CH bond. And we did the Suarez reaction again. Uh, and this went in 95% yield. So when, these, when that O is very close to the, the CH, these work extremely well uh, to give us directly uh, the compound shown here. Now, in accordance with some of Wegel's findings, we then treated this uh, with in situ generated ruthenium tetroxide. And what's believed to happen is this tertiary uh, CH is oxidized, uh, then this CH bond, and then you get an oxidative cleavage of the diol. So that basically rips open uh, that CC bond, and you can see that we're now kind of back to where we were with iron. Um, this goes in about 70% yield. Now, in one of the most uh, incredible reactions, I think, on this project, and this one took quite a bit of time, Matt found this quadruple oxidation uh, with selenium dioxide. So this basically desaturates both sides or, or one side of the ketone to give you an enone. And it also does that very challenging uh, methyl group to carboxylic oxidation. Okay, and this is actually about a 50% yield, which I, which I think is quite incredible. I should also note, you can get about 15% uh, of this sextuple oxidation product. So this is six CH activations. Um, Matt has been able to carry this material forward to geodephinolide in what is a 10-step total synthesis. So I think that's about the short we can get. We'll never, we'll never catch uh, Ryan Shenby's group, unfortunately. Uh, and some of the yields here are pretty awful. Um, we've had a real struggle optimizing uh, this 15. Um, these conditions are also quite, quite aggressive, as you can, can imagine. We get a lot of decomposition. Nevertheless, with the major isomer, we can convert it to this enol lactone. So l selectride will reduce the carbonyl. And then base will isomerize that allylic alcohol to a ketone. The acetate comes off, and this just zips right up uh, into this compound shown here. Now, recall in the last synthesis, we did that alpha ketol rearrangement uh, under basic conditions. Uh, we were kind of limited in this new scaffold in that a lot of these intermediates were unstable to both acid and base. So we really only had one workable a solution to get to the end. And that was to oxidize this with DMDO. This is a nice clean process, uh, leaves around essentially no, no byproducts. And then we take that material and we blast it to 170 degrees. Um, if you treat this with base or acid, it's going to go to crap quite quickly. But thermally, this will undergo a very nice alpha ketal rearrangement. And that gives you this uh, uh, tricyclic uh, ring system, which is really uh, the starting point for most of these compounds. So this is a, a formal synthesis of geodephinolide. To synthesize medusin, which had not been prepared and something uh, we viewed as kind of one of the, the pinnacle members, and if we could access it, we could probably make all of these. Uh, we did a directed reduction, which also 
uh, reestablishes the six-membered ring lactone. A little bit of acid will induce an one elimination, giving us the alkene. And then we oxidized uh, adjacent to that ester with some pretty standard enolate chemistry. And this was well known in the literature to come from the outer face. So this is the incorrect stereochemistry. And right around this time, uh, my colleague John Hartwig had published this really nice paper, Nature Chemistry of Inverting uh, Alcohols uh, by Ruthenium uh, Catalyzed Transfer Hydrogenation. You can imagine just trying to epimerize this with base. That doesn't work so well. So we tried uh, Hartwig's chemistry. It worked very nicely on the first try. So heating it up with this ruthenium complex uh, first oxidizes the alcohol to the ketone. Then you add in some isopropanol. You may presumably make a different ruthenium hydride, which re-reduces it from the exophase and gives us what is net uh, epimerization. And then to finish this, all we need to do is that directed uh, reaction. And this, again, uh, comes from the desired phase, giving us uh, a 10 oxidation process and, and 14 net steps um, from very simple, inexpensive materials. I should also mention uh, Luis in my lab um, has recently gotten a nice hit along with Kevin that we can indeed oxidize this last a tertiary position with DMDO, although we've only done this on a very small scale, so I don't have a yield. But this is kind of one of the last uh, missing pieces uh, in terms of getting essentially access to almost all of the CH bonds. So I, I mentioned this in our first slide. These are the different oxidations known for this scaffold. And really within about two years and a few good students, uh, this is what we've shown is possible on Cedrol. The only thing that's left is really um, the oxidation of that methyl group circled in red. So that is one we've struggled with. We have some, some hits with uh, directed silation to get there. And that's really the missing link to kind of the final members of this series, uh, those anisatin type compounds. You can see the, be the beta-lactone uh, carbonyl is indeed that methyl group. Uh, nevertheless, uh, with this chemistry, we've already been able uh, to make these 10 compounds. And with that, I think I'm running out of time. I would like to thank my group as well as uh, the NIH for funding our, our terpene program. Uh, this was really, really took some, some dedicated students. A lot of these reactions, I, I think, as many of you know, are quite challenging and not always uh, as easy as they look in, in uh, a synthetic paper or talk. So uh, really Kevin and Matt did a lot of work and they've been joined with by some really talented visitors, uh, Luis, as well as, um, of course, Takahiro. And again, Hugh, thank you for the invitation and the chance to speak about uh, some of these applications of, of CH activation and synthetic planning. I'm happy to take any questions.